Well, welcome to all of you on this uh, very special day in our nation and uh, down through the years we've been privileged to commemorate this day. There's a song by Jimmy Fortune based on the response of a mother uh, whose son gave the supreme sacrifice in military action for our country. The definition of supreme sacrifice I like is lifted from a British paratrooper who landed in Normandy in 1944. It's the supreme sacrifice as one who gives all of his or her tomorrows for our today. And we have that to remember today, all those who gave all their tomorrows, and we have this day. This mother that heard this newtcaster criticizing those who would choose to waste their lives in military service for their country was asked by a reporter what she would say or how she'd reply to that critic. And her reply was simple. I wish he would meet me at Arlington. She said, I wish he would come and stand with me at the marker of my son's grave in Arlington Cemetery. Maybe then he would know just how I feel. Well, today, on this Memorial Day weekend, I want to ask you to stand with me at Rephidim and to consider what God has to say about Israel's first military victory of armed conflict, and the fact that God even ordered that a memorial would be established for this very day of victory that Israel had. So I invite you this morning to this great victory at Rephidim uh, that Israel experienced, their first Memorial Day. And for that, I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 17. That will be our home base. And just a little bit of context as we work through this. The message will be organized around five different words. We'll follow them sequentially, working through this passage Exodus 17, and uh, going from verse 8 down through verse 16. Note the first verse of the text. It answers the where question. Where uh, did this victory occur? And it's very clear, and Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Rephidim is a location somewhere between the Red Sea and Sinai. And uh, the question we can ask is, when did it occur? Well, they haven't arrived at Sinai, so Israel experienced, let's back up, a great deliverance just a matter of weeks earlier. Uh, weeks earlier, there was the great Passover, a day that continues to live as a permanent memorial in Israel's recollection of their great history. That was their deliverance, which led them into form a nation. And uh, they were delivered from the full force of the Egyptian army, which was the strongest military force in the world at that day. And this for victory that came uh, later, just a little few days later at the Red Sea, was a victory of tremendous proportions. Uh, it was a victory, as I say, against the strongest military force, and one what was also memorialized in a national celebration. You can read of it in Exodus 15, where we have the Song of Moses and the Song of Miriam. However, in neither of these events, the Passover, deliverance, and then the deliverance at the Red Sea, did Israel deploy even a single soldier. And yet they had these stunning victories. In fact, they were instructed as they approached the Red Sea, do not fear, stand by and see salvation, which Yahweh will accomplish for you while you keep silent. And so it was that warrior Yahweh fought the battle for them and delivered to them a most decisive oh, victory over overwhelming odds. In fact, it was an improbable deliverance that they experienced there. And the impact of this deliverance, the news of that spread around the whole known world there, surrounding nations, literally began to tremble in dismay at what was happening. We can 
Recall that 40 years later at Jericho, they were still trembling at what happened at that Red Sea victory. And uh, not only did they tremble, according to Exodus 15, said that these nations were in a state of being as motionless as stone. What a great victory was accomplished there. But Israel didn't deploy a single soldier. But now as we stand at Rephidim, we find Israel confronted by an armed army that demands their first military action, one which they had to form up under direct charge from Yahweh. And uh, it's a victory accomplished there that was instantly memorialized, the first memorial arising from engagement in military conflict. Well, what was happening? Well, as you notice the text, Amalek came and fought against Israel. There was an armed conflict that arose. And further to the what question, who? Who is this? Who attacked them? Who are the Amalekites? Well, I have two answers to that. First, they were a terrorist band, a marauding group, uh, living off of booty looted from caravans that came from the Tigris, Euphrates Valley, down to the Nile Delta, and back again. And so they're in the wilderness, uh, living off of that kind of a life. But the second and most important uh, aspect of who they were, the Amalekites were blood relatives of the Israelites. Amalek was a grandson of Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. And this band, that this large entourage that's moving through the wilderness, is Israel, the descendants of Jacob. So the Amalekites, in many ways, were sons of their father, sons of Esau. Because if you study the life of Esau, he was himself a nomadic, undisciplined, holy, world-centered man. And thus, in a real sense, the Amalekites and Israelites are brothers, but there is a great contrast between their hearts and their passions and their destiny. But they possessed a common heritage under Abraham as their patriarchal father. And so this familiar brotherhood connection was there. Now it's probably five to eight generations that have passed since uh, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. But nevertheless, that common family root was there, and it should have had some kind of influence on the Amalekites some memory of their history, but they engage in this cowardly, devilish terror. So back to the what question. What was Amalek's intention in this attack? And what's the nature of their attack? Well, as you see the text, it says Amalek came. It seems to imply that they were seeking out Israel in this regard and to engage in an unprovoked attack. We're not told directly what led them to seek out Israel, but I have a suspicion. I assume that the Israel's astounding deliverance from Egypt at the Red Sea, and now they're moving through the wilderness, led them to understand that this group is not just coming to go visit somewhere out in the wilderness. They're going, they are moving eastward to take possession of a land take possession of the land that was denied to their forefather Esau. And so this caravan is moving there, and they suspect, and they should have known, it was them moving to a place of permanent residence. So Amalek came purposefully to engage a peaceful, unarmed people, literally brothers, and they hit them with a surprise military assault somewhat like Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Now, the scriptures make no mention of casualties. Certainly, there must have been injuries and even uh, loss of life in this attack, but we have no biblical account for that. So, let's look at the cause. The cause that was here that stirred Israel to fight. We're not told in this passage in Exodus exactly what the cause was and how the attack proceeded, but we are privileged to have an account in Deuteronomy 25, 
And I'll read from verse 17 to 18. Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. This is Moses speaking probably 38 years later, uh, just before Moses passes off the scene and passes the baton to Joshua. And then, remember how he met you along the way and attacked you among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary. And then this very important phrase, and he did not fear God. It's clear that this was a cowardly, spiteful action by Amalek, purely for the purpose of inflicting terror and discouragement. It was a decidedly evil, dastardly action, one that was decidedly mean-spirited and wholly unprovoked. They attacked the stragglers at the back. They attacked the faint and the weary, the weak and the elderly, the most vulnerable of the people. They didn't try to obstruct them from the front. They assaulted them from the rear. So the purpose was to terrorize, even likely to have them turn back to Egypt. Anything to prevent them from approaching what they could already understand was a destiny to take possession of Canaan. So in the face with such an attack, how might Israel respond? So I move to the word strategy. Let's look at the strategy of Israel's response. Israel was to mount an immediate armed resistance, a quick strike, armed force, to attack them. It was required, a counterattack. And it's Moses' instruction is clear there in verse 8, choose men from among us and go out, fight against Amalek. This is instruction to Joshua. This was his call. Now, it seems quite clear that we have an example here of a theory of just war, articulated by Augustine here a millennia later, and I'm not going to develop any of that today. But Yahweh instructed, or Moses instructed, and Yahweh directed Moses to do this, to mount this attack. There seems to be no confusion or hesitation in regard to a missional strategy on Israel's part. Go out there, assault, attack Amalek. No fear of causing them that would shrink back. Israel was called and engaged Amalek militarily. In the face of this crisis, the leadership responded forthrightly, directly, and they responded with military force. Now, it's important for us to just get a little more of the picture. At this point, Israel is still an embryo nation. They haven't been formed a nation. They haven't arrived at Sinai. They're not a nation yet. They are a, a pilgrim people. They were shepherd folk dwelling in Egypt. They've been there now, if we work this out properly, since Jacob moved his family there, and that was 215 years earlier. So they've had all that time as living as shepherds there in Egypt. And uh, so, so they have no experience militarily. They've not even had a chance to prepare for it. And yet Joshua is to mount an attack. He's quickly appointed what we might call general of the armed militia or something like that. Uh, and he assembled, he's commissioned to assemble this rapid response attack force in one day. How would you like that as your order, your charge? His volunteers or conscripts from the separate tribes were completely untrained in military tactics. They were untrained in weaponry. The only weaponry they had, well, Quite a bit of it, I guess, is what they scavenged from the destruction of the Egyptian army there at the Red Sea. But they've had no experience with it. They haven't had any training. They haven't even had a single war game exercise. And here they are to mount this attack. So Joshua must lead, form this, lead this militia without a single hour of training, either in weaponry or tactics. And we read in verse 10 there, And Joshua did as Moses told him, and fought against Amalek. All that's involved in that phrase, 
your imagination is going to have to fill in. But it must have been truly daunting for Joshua. Well, when we consider Israel and they're vulnerable, they're truly in a very precarious position here, uh, entering the armed conflict. They not only have a novice commander, uh, they also have a completely untrained uh, uh, soldiers around them. And it says, Joshua fought against Amalek. And when you see that phrase in verse 10, I'd have you notice that when it says, Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek, it doesn't end with a period. This armed attack was the first prong in the strategy of that day. The attack against uh, Israel, as I said, a dastardly, mean-spirited, unprovoked attack by Amalek, was not met with military action alone, uh, whatever preparation they had. It was another resource that was available to them, a resource that would spell the, dis the difference in this particular action on this Memorial Day at Rephidim. In fact, please note that the battle plan, even from the beginning in the text before you now, was from Moses to also go to the arena of conflict. He was not going to be on the plane of battle, but he was positioned up on a hill, removed from the military action. And so he's overlooking that, uh, that action. You see it says there in verse 9 and 10, uh, the last phrase of each one, tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God, with the rod of Elohim in my hand. This rod of Elohim is the one that was held over the Red Sea and it departed. This rod of Elohim was, just in the previous paragraph, was what Moses used to strike the rock, and a gush of water came through. In fact, a river of water came forth that followed Israel for 40 years. What power is in that rod of Elohim? No, what power is in Elohim, wielded by his servant, Moses, in this case? And the last part of verse 10 says, And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. So here's the second prong in the attack. There's the military prong that Joshua leads. Moses is leading the other one. He's going to be positioned on a hill, must be at an observation point where he could see the, the battle. And from there, in a sense, Moses wielded the big gun in this military action. This was the one that made the difference. Moses' spiritual discernment in this moment of crisis is impressive to me when we think a little bit about his background. In his earlier years, before fleeing Egypt and entering his 40-year stint as a shepherd in wilderness area, he would have relied entirely on his own prowess with the sword, his own military genius. You see, while Moses was part of the royal family in Egypt, he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was trained at the equivalent of our West Point. He had military training, and he went on to command some significant military campaigns from some extra-biblical records. One in particular notes that an instance of his leading a campaign into Ethiopia. And the campaign, when he came back, what it says in the, what I read, came back loaded with the spoils from his vanquished foes. In fact, it was his genius and success in several of those campaigns. And that success actually cemented Moses, according to some writers, as Pharaoh designate. He would be the next Pharaoh in line because of the prowess that he manifest militarily. Well, of course that didn't happen. He chose to identify himself with the people of God, and he fled Egypt. But the point is, Moses was neither a novice with military action, nor was he a pacifist. He was wise and experienced in military truth, and the truth be told, God had in his wisdom and providence schooled Moses in both prongs of the attack, for the military prong and for the intercessory prong. 
And that's part of the greatness of Moses. God working in his heart and he being malleable. Of course, he had some hard time submitting, that's of course. But the lesson to us is clear. It's crucially important. It shouldn't be missed and we shouldn't glance over it. Behind and internal to every conflict, there is an underlying spiritual conflict. And I don't have to develop this because Pastor Randy spoke on this just not too many Sundays ago from Daniel chapter 10. But that's a reality, and we ought not to forget that. And I'm reminding you of that truth. So God had matured Moses spiritually to the point where this vital prong of intercession was in the strategy from the very beginning. He knew its strategic place. Uh, and we, as individuals, we as a church body, we as a nation, ought to be sharply attuned to that truth, that this intercessory prong is vital in our lives, our church, our nation. And uh, it's a fundamental principle of reality, and we ought not to forget. You see, victories at uh, Midway or Guadalcanal or Normandy or Desert Storm or so on, uh, they by themselves do not assure us any future, any success, whatever. The principle that's stated in Proverbs 21, 31 stands, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to Yahweh. That's been true in every battle we've gone through. I have threatened sometime, Mike would be a far stronger candidate, but to write on the providence of God and how that worked even in the Normandy campaign. It's amazing how God intervened in our history. And uh, so, the text urges us to regularly be in prayer for our nation. Well, since Yahweh's sovereignty never diminishes, Yahweh's omnipotent omnipresence is always there, it's always immutable, it never vanishes, it goes away. So the principle stands in every age, and it's an absolute principle that in every armed conflict, the victory belongs to Yahweh. And the people, we ought to be a near alert to that. Well, let's move to the next word, which is outcome. What was the outcome of this two-pronged attack that was mounted against Amalek? So now uh, look at verse 13. Notice the outcome of this attack. That of military action conjoined with intercessory prayer. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. You see, there was an overwhelming victory here. But note the word overcame. That's a sort of a rare, a little more rare Hebrew word. Uh, from the Aramaic usage, we're told, it can be translated mowed down, disabled, prostrated, laid on the ground. Boy, Joshua and his military really uh, assaulted them under the working of Yahweh through them. In fact, the Amplified Bible puts it this way, this verse, and Joshua mowed down a disabled Amalek and his people with the sword. So the story ends well. The good guys win, and the villains are soundly righted. Now, we like stories like that, do we not? We like stories like that, especially when it pertains to our nation in situations, and of course, our lives and so on. But I'm deeply concerned that we in present-day America, both in regard to our national leadership and our general citizenry, we are becoming, or we have already become, grossly dull to the core essential in Israel's successful strategy at Rephidim. We're dull to the big gun that Moses exercised. I refer not only to the need to have a prepared defense. You see, Joshua had no prepared military. It's important to have that. But, but, the indispensable spiritual component wielded by Moses. 
And you and I as citizens in our nation are called to wield that force. We are partners in that particular action of upholding the rod of Elohim. So the record is both clear, it's to the point. The role of Moses as intercessory was critical. It was decisive to the victory that Israel experienced here. So we read on further in verse 11, so it came about when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, when it rested, Amalek prevailed. You see, Martin Luther knew this indispensable requirement, even in his religious campaign, defending the gospel. You know it in his most famous hymn, you know it well, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Do you ask who that is, who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth. Oh, that great name, that name of God that defends his glory, that defends his honor. And in this case, his honor was being attacked. Lord Sabaoth is named from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. So penned Martin Luther. Very fitting to this particular passage and victory. So now, uh, well, I should really comment uh, on that. I just wrote a note here from Exodus 15, 3 and 6. If you look from the, the Red Sea campaign, there after that victory, and the Song of Moses says, Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, is majestic in power. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemies. Go to Exodus 15, read it. That's the account as Moses penned it there. So, with that, I ask you to look at a few brief lessons that we can pull out of this. Lesson one, God has a passion for justice in human affairs. God is just, and he loves justice. And he loves to see justice exercised, implemented in the affairs of a nation. In fact, all affairs and personal interactions, uh, whatever they may be. When Amalek came up from behind and launched this unprovoked, mean-spirited attack on the affirmed and the faint, the call was clear and to the point, go out and fight with Amalek. Don't let it continue. Force it to be brought to nothing, disintegrated. Amalek's charge was an assault on what was moral and what was right and what justice required. And so the attack went forward. And that leads me to the next word, the charge. Let our eyes look down a little bit now to verse 16. It's at the, the last verse there. The Lord, or Yahweh, has sworn. In the King James, the authorized version, Geneva, it says, because Yahweh has sworn. Literally, the rendering of that is, because a hand is placed upon, or a hand is placed against the throne of Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh has sworn that Yahweh will have war with Amalek. See, he's a God of justice, insists on it, because this was an incident that in God's point of view, as it's explained here, that Amalek was literally placing his hand on the throne of Yahweh to destroy it, to bring it down. And so Israel was to respond with using both prongs of their attack. So from Yahweh's absolutely righteous and just perspective, Amalek, this grossly profane, marauding band and their attack on Israel was an attack against his own perpetually glorious, his invincible throne. And so he required this kind of response. 
You see, God takes what's perpetrated toward his people as done to himself. Let me say that again. God takes what is perpetrated toward his people as done against himself. That's one reason why I'm very passionate for the persecuted church. I don't know whether you have any partnership with organizations involved in that, but I have said this before, and I, I'll, I'll be vulnerable in front. I have prayer times, prayer walks during the week. Every Monday morning, I spend my whole time praying for the persecuted church because what's happening to them is an assault against the throne of Yahweh, and we must stand. We must, we must care. How can we not care? So their attack amidst multiple evidences of Yahweh's power. You see, Amalek, come, just think of the, their attack. What was happening as Israel was moving? Amalek certainly heard of their, the deliverance of Yahweh from Egypt, both the Passover and at Red Sea. But even while they were attacking him here, the cloud was over Israel. It was a pillar of fire at night, and so it was all the visible signs there as long as understanding what was happening in life or during these past few weeks. You know, as we read the prophets, we find again and again that God is stirred to anger and he's stirred to judgment because injustice is allowed to reign. You just read through the major and minor pro prophets, that principle rises up when Injustice becomes pervasive in a nation. God is stirred to judgment. The prophets give repeated emphasis to upholding these four pillars in a national governance. Those four pillars are righteousness, justice, truth, and morality. Just study the Old Testament, you'll find that those four principles guide God's judgment in all those situations. And as Christians, we need to be discerning. We need to understand God's values and God's concerns and what moves him to, to action. And when these pillars are allowed to decline, when they're allowed to crumble and become trampled in the street, uh, God sees it as an assault on his throne because he stands for those principles, always. And sooner or later, if there's no repentance, he'll be moved to act with wrath and wrathful justice. Amalek was doomed because by Yahweh, by his immutability of his character, he was moved to adopt a posture of hostility towards Amalek. You notice it in the end of verse 16. Yahweh has sworn. He's moved to action because a hand has been placed on his throne, but he will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Uh, in fact, if you go to, we don't have it on the screen, I don't think, maybe I do, I forgot, uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse 19. Yes, we did put it there. How about that? There it says, when it talks in Deuteronomy about the, him attacking from the rear to the weak and the faint and the elderly, it says, Therefore it shall come about when Yahweh your Elohim has given you rest, when you get into the land and you're at rest from surrounding enemies, and the land Yahweh your Elohim gives you as an inheritance to protest, you shall, this is important, this is an order, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. You see the force of that? That's why I say Yahweh has a passion for justice. And when the hand is put against the throne of Yahweh, there's action. I know that some find this attitude of divine vengeance uh, sharply contrary to their perception of God, but I have only a, a brief comment. I won't, can't develop that here. But I would say that a true knowledge of God must embrace 
the full and true counsels of his word, the examples of the word and the instructions in his word. Here we have a clear example that Natsky fits, as I've already said, connects with, with the prophets as you read them. The breathed out revel revelation of God here introduces or forms us, instructs us to the fullness of God's character. And we must be turned into that. God has set in, in his truth, he has set before mankind a defining aspect of his character, and we see one of that in this particular text right here. Well, another passion, a uh, lesson I would raise up. God has a passion for mankind to know him. Because in this text right here that he ordained, he introduces himself by a new name. This is a new revelation that God is giving to man. And uh, it is that he is, the Lord is my banner, is in the English. And the uh, Hebrew, of course, that's Yahweh Nisse. I think I have that on, on a slide. I intended to. Uh, and this word Nisse comes from a word which means to lift up as an ensign, as a pole, as a standard uh, to be there. It is to be high. It is, it is something that is conspicuous. And when that rod was conspicuously high, Joshua had success in battle. It is to be conspicuously visible, conspicuously influential. Yahweh is that one. When he is elevated, in the affairs of a nation because we acknowledge his name, his sovereignty, and we come to him in prayer and we intercede. We're lifting the rod of Elam, making it influential and conspicuous. That's the charge to the church. It's our duty to do that, not only in our church here, but in the nation as well. So a point to note here, the rod of Elohim, it literally, it is the one and only rod of Elohim, but it symbolized the pledge and possession of Elohim's divine presence and his power. When that was raised, the presence of Yahweh was influential within the battlefield. It was evident uh, in that worked out in, in the victory that he had there. Well, another lesson that I would raise up is that God has ordained memorials to be established for remembrance of his great and gracious works. Notice it in verse 14, it's on the screen. Then Yahweh said to Moses, write this in a book. Literally, it is in the book. There's a very particular book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Now this is quite explicit statement here. First of all, write this as a memorial. That's why I say this is Israel's first memorial day at this, on this battlefield here. Later, God established other memorials. They were, of course, the Passover as a memorial, a Feast of first fruits, and, and so on. Even the Sabbath was a memorial. We in our church celebrate uh, memorials. We celebrate the Lord's Day as a memorial to his resurrection and the birth of the church. And uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, remembering his death. These are memorials, Pentecost and, and these things. But it says here, the book. It's a very important book, and that's why I say the writing and remembering of memorials is very important, because the reference to book is specific. I read it as the book, and uh, there was at that time, evidently, a particular book where some of these victories were recorded in the book. In fact, if you look carefully, the concordance or so on, in Numbers 21, 14, it's the only verse that I could find in this regard. It says, therefore it is said, in the book of wars of Yahweh. They gave a title to the book. The book of wars. Well, this is obviously one of the wars. I suspect that the victory at the Red Sea is recorded in that book. And so there was a book of wars. 
I don't know what the first entry is. I believe it's the Red Sea, but the second entry is here. So memorials are important. Keep a record of your victories. We as a nation need to keep a record of our military victories. It's an important thing to memorialize them because the hand of Yahweh has been involved in all of those. And we memorialize them. They're important. They're important lessons of God's working on our behalf. And we ought not to let that sink away. Uh, the memorial, the word, refers to a rehearsing of the mind, literally. And we are to write down for future rehearsing in the mind events. And this book of wars, I reckon the leaders were instructed to read that book. Uh, I personally would want to suggest that when Joshua took command from Moses, he read from that book. When Joshua, just less than a year after this, and with the spies went in to spy out the land, he might have recalled this event. He might have. I don't know. Certainly when he was to initiate the Jericho campaign, almost 40 years later, the night before, if you read from jo Joshua 5, he was out praying and worrying, and he met the captain of the host. He met the pre-incarnate Christ. He met Yahweh who was going to exercise the big gun at Jericho. I believe Joshua read from the book. See, the opposite of memorializing, of remembering, is to forget, to just let it drop from the mind. It's to lose cognitive uh, understanding and to lose soul appreciation. That's the important thing. We have to have an appreciation uh, from that. It's just to let, let these great works of Yahweh in their mind sink into oblivion. That's what happens with the lack of memorials or the destruction of memorials. To forget is to lose precious awareness of God's amazing prayer providence and faithfulness. And that's great loss. The uh, Psalm 11, uh, 111 I mean, says, Great are the works of Yahweh studied by all who delight in them, splendid and majestic is his work. He has made his wonderful acts to be remembered. The word there literally is to be memorialized. Yahweh is gracious and compassion. Well, you see, memorials are important. They're important to the health and well-being of a nation. They're important to a church and its work and mission, and, mission, uh, and so on. Memorials can serve many benefits. And we can notice that, you see, Moses went on and he built an altar. I believe the altar was named Yahweh Nisse uh, in that regard. Altars must be built. If you study again the, here the, the, the Pentateuch and so on, how often these patriarchs built altars, altars must be built. Places of meeting God and worship and true worship is always fueled and connected to truth. Worship is mightily enriched by memorials, by remembering the great works of God and establishing them in there. So just a few quick takeaways. Uh, the point of Amalek's action in our lesson, we can see that there are many nations and peoples down through history that have fallen away as wrecks of time because they put their hand against the throne of Yahweh. Amalek, Babylon, the Third Reich, and so on. You can think about these in history. And concerning the point that Amalek in Deuteronomy 25, 19, did not fear God. He had no respect for God when the visible presence of God was powerful. And I say that this virtue the fear of God is the most basic and most essential virtue in a life. I've said that and said no love should be, but I tell you, where there is no reverence, when there's no respect, deep respect, that's part of this fear. Love can't flower. Love can't flourish. So I say that's important. And the other point is no nation is immune from just judgment of Yahweh when its leaders dare to place either through national policy 
or societal practice their hand against the throne of Yahweh. And so there are very important lessons here. So I, I go quickly into the last slide then. Uh, I move to one that is meaningful in my mind. This uh, part of a tour I took back in 2004. I stopped at the American Cemetery in Luxembourg, uh, where so many of our brave men gave their supreme sacrifice. I think it's the largest cost of life in any particular battle in American history. And there is a, a chapel. It's a small, tall chapel. It's not a very big room at all. But on the side of that is a, an inscription, which I copied. It says, God grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and make no peace with oppression. That's stuck in my mind. We need to think about it in the whole of our lives. It's a memorial prayer that can find many different actions uh, in our own lives, a call to action. So both the prongs of engagement and battle for righteous, right and justices, uh, for justice, righteousness, truth, and morality will not be realized if these two forces are not combined to fearlessly contend against evil and make no peace with oppression. So whether it be Memorial Day at Rephidim or Memorial Day here in our beloved United States, a nation which still has its motto on our coins and God we trust, I emphasize the, the upholding of these values that move the heart of God. These values of righteousness, justice, truth, and morality require a citizenry. They require a citizenry that purposes to live with a vital and vibrant fear of God. We cannot let that go lose. That is the sole substance that gives force and substance to our uh, exercise of what we feel and what we see developing here. Uh, that is, we refuse to let the hands get tired that hold up the rod of Elohim, steady and high and conspicuous. Dear friends, we must hold it up in your life, in our church, and in our nation. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you for your grace in giving us these wonderful narratives in Scripture of your mighty working and these great revelations of your own character. Lord, I pray that what we've looked at here this morning would be influential in each of our lives to the end that we would hold high your rod, your force, the reality of your presence and power in our lives, and particularly that we would be intercessors for, against that and for the, that which upholds, which is all that's righteous and true and just and moral, and that opposes that which assaults your very character. Make us this kind of people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.